So my guest is Steve Osted, uh, Chair of Biology from the University of Alabama in Birmingham. And now I'd like to ask him about laboratory animals and whether they're really good models for the kinds of studies that we're doing. One thing you told me earlier today is that the three main species that we've been using, uh, C. elegans worms and mice and Drosophila fruit flies, all have, are actually, their whole history is combined with humans. They've spread around the globe with humans. Yeah, and, and, and you might think that that's an advantage because they really share our environment. So mice live in our house, fruit flies live in our orchards, and the worms also live in our orchards, and they've sort of moved around the world with us. So it sounds like they'd be good models. And I think that they may or they may not be. Now, one of the things that happens and one of the things that evolutionary biologists are beginning to point out is that very quickly when you take those animals and you bring them in the laboratory and produce, reproduce them for research, they change very quickly. And they change in ways that, that, that may be disturbing for so the So the useful. laboratory animals we're studying are not the same as the ones in the wild? Not at all. Let's just take one example, it's the mice. The mice that we use in research are mice that were brought into the lab a century ago. Really, a century? A century ago, and they were used before that. They weren't even wild mice. So that's they 100 were or 200 or 300 generations. Yeah, many generations, at least 200 Is generations. that enough time for evolution to act? Or oh, it's plenty of time for evolution if selection is very strong. And these animals initially were selected for bizarre coat colors because they were used in People mouse wanted shows. White mice, right? Well, they were used in mouse shows. Though. Mouse shows. Just like they, we have dog shows and bird really? shows, there were mouse shows. So they had curly, silky, all kinds of fur. Huh. Then they took those and they brought them into the laboratory where they mass produced them, which means that you're having them, the ones that reproduce the earliest and reproduce the fast are the ones that leave the most. So you're really offspring. selecting for early reproduction, having a lot of pups. Yeah. Very quickly, if you compare the today's laboratory mouse with a wild mouse, they reach maturity at about in, in, a, in about half the time really? of a wild, and they have about twice as many pups. What about their size and weight and they're, lifespan? Th yeah, they're bigger, they're fatter. A little bit bigger. Uh, they're about twice as big. Whoa, twice so, as big. Yeah, if, if you show a laboratory researcher a wild mice, they'd think it was a pup. They wouldn't think it was really? an adult. Yeah. Well, what are the other differences? Well, one of the things, after we, after we selected them for all these other things, and for or the other thing we selected them for is not to bite us, so we can hold them and they don't bite us. And the ones that bit us and escaped, those genes are out of the population. Mm -hmm. Then after we did all that, we made it brother and sister together for hundreds of generations to make them all genetically identical. That sounds pretty abnormal, actually. Yeah, so uh, what, what I call them now is mouse-like objects, not mice. <laughs> Right, right. So what are the implications for medical research? Are people assuming that these mice are like wild mice? Especially for your research on aging, it sounds like there might be implications. Yeah, well, f for one thing, they live about, the laboratory mice live about 20% shorter. So they have shorter lifespans. So they have shorter Even lifespans. though they have these sheltered lives. Yes, they do. Well, uh, no, I'm comparing them to wild mice that are also living in, in the, the laboratory. Okay. okay, so it's about 20% So shorter. they basically age faster, though. They age faster, and the implication of that is that if we find a treatment, whether it's dietary restriction or we give them a, a, a drug and they live longer, we don't know if the same would be true of a wild mouse that has not been subjected to this intense laboratory selection. This like, sounds like something that badly needs to be done. Uh, I, I think it would be a very good thing. The other thing that we need to do is we meet, need to make the laboratory environment a little bit more like a wild environment. You know, one of the things that we've done is we've taken all of the germs out of the laboratory. And germs are something that we live with, you know, we all get colds and flu and everything every year. So our response to germs is an important aspect of our health that we really can't study in, in the laboratory mice the way they're studied now. So if you find a gene that influences rate of aging in mice, it might not be relevant to the rate of aging in the mouse in the wild. It may not be, we don't know that. Certainly there's some work with fruit flies that show that a gene that was uh, basically uh, tuned up in those mice, which had a major effect on laboratory fruit flies, had very little effect in wild flies. In fact, had no effect in one sex at all. Really? So that's something that we always have to be thinking about, should be always in the back of our mind, is that our laboratory animals are very, very artificial animals, and they may tell us something about the human condition, but they also may not. 
sounds like this leads to you possibly having recommendations for laboratory research in general. Yes. Well, I, first of all, I think we need to get away from having using only a single inbred strain. It's analogous to only testing a drug on a single person again and again and again. Right. And as we all know, people respond differently to drugs. So that's number one. Number two, I think we need to expose our animals in a controlled way to infections because the drugs interactions with infections are very, very important. If we take a drug that's wonderful for our heart and wonderful for our lungs, but kills us the next time we get a flu right. virus, it's not going to be all right. that advantageous. And I think you've done studies on dietary restrictions in mice showing it's very different for the wild mice and for the laboratory mice. That's right. The wild mice that I subjected to uh, dietary restriction did not live longer. Really? A tiny fraction of them did. So I'm thinking this is one the of the oldest old. The oldest old lived longer. Thinking this is one of the places where genetic variation may turn out to be important. In fact, follow-up right. studies where they took a, a, a large number of, of laboratory mice diff of different genetic forms and they subjected them all to dietary restrictions. Some of them lived longer, some of them there was no change, and some of them lived shorter. So that could easily turn out to be the case with us. It may be that eating three days a week is very beneficial for you, Randy, but maybe it wouldn't be so beneficial for me. I'd prefer to learn that eating seven days a week is good for me, <laughs> but um, we'll have to see about that. So can people get their genes run and find out something about their longevity? Well, they can, but right now the, the genetic impact on longevity is much lower than most people think. It only mm. explains about a quarter of the variation in longevity, unless you happen to be one of the unfortunate people that have one of these genes that we know is associated with cancer or dementia or heart disease. There are genes like that, and we're very good now at getting our genes scanned to look for these major effects. But in terms of just understanding whether you're going to live to be 78 or 85 or 89, we're not, we're not there yet. So are those genes that cause bad things to happen just glitches in the system? Or do they possibly give other advantages at other times in well, life? Well, that is, that is very possible that they're not just glitches, that those are genes that were beneficial, maybe in an early environment because they boosted reproduction or they accelerated age of maturity or one of those things. So if we find a gene that makes people age faster, we shouldn't just knock it out in everybody? Probably not. That probably would not be a good idea. And, and in fact, I think one of the things that we're beginning to appreciate is that genes do not have single effects like this and we need to look at their effects throughout the lifespan, not just at one age. So we talked about mice. Are there things about C. elegans or about Drosophila that are also along these lines? Oh, well, with C. elegans, it's much, much worse than it is. So C. elegans, mice. describe what that is, if you would. So C. elegans is a small, uh, round worm. Like about, really small. Uh, about half the size of a grain of rice. So Pretty very small. small. But it's the animal that we probably know more about than any other animal in the world. We know everything about its genetics. We know exactly how many brain cells it has. We know exactly how many muscle cells it has. And it doesn't have that many cells, right? How many no, it has 969, 969 cells. 969 cells. So we know this exact, they that all have the same number of that's cells. That's marvelous. Yeah. Now, these things were brought into the laboratory and bred for hundreds of generations before they finally realized they could freeze them down. So they'd undergone selection for all of the unusual things that they have to do. Like reproducing early in life and laying a lot of eggs. Laying a lot of eggs quickly. Um, and lack of defenses against infection because they're in a safe place. They're right? in a safe place. They're, they're living in a, they're eating things that they never live. We feed them bacteria that are human gut bacteria. They never encounter these in nature. So it turns out that what we feed them is sort of uh, not, not very good for them. If we so they're getting junk food. They're getting junk food. If, if we, f they, we feed them live bacteria, and if we kill that bacteria, they live 20% longer. Really? Yeah, but yet the people that study them continue to use the live bacteria because it's for their... It's, it's um, traditional. It's traditional and has some benefits. They can, mm -hmm. they can affect some of the genes, the way the genes act by feeding So what, is there any significance to the potential evolutionary changes in C. elegans that's evolved in the laboratory? Well, we don't know that. We don't know that because everybody uses exactly the same control animals. So they're, they're all twins, essentially. They're all a long series of a single set of twins, yes. Hmm. 
So we don't know the implications. So they, do they of that. reproduce sexually? Is this a uh, most of the time they reproduce asexually. Occasionally there will be a male produced, mm -hmm. and that male. Uh, but the males don't last very long. They mm -hmm. they somehow disappear from the population. So mostly they're genetically identical. So almost every laboratory in the world that works on C. elegans works on the same genetic individuals. But they're attractive for aging research because, as I understand it, you can influence certain alleles and make the life span dramatically longer. They're wonderful for aging research, for understanding the basic biology of aging, they're wonderful. They, they become adults in three days, they live two weeks. Um, so you we, don't have to have a dissertation lasting 10 years? No, we can knock out every gene, in, we've knocked out every gene in the genome, we mm -hmm. can over, we can, uh, they're wonderful for that. Mm -hmm. what, what we don't know is how relevant a lot of that is going to turn out to be for humans. Now we have found some things that work the same in the laboratory worm and the laboratory so, so mouse. What are, what are some things that are the same? No, well, if you, if you um, partially disable the activity of insulin, then in both cases, mice and humans, I'm, I'm sorry, worms and mice, they live substantially longer. Now, mm -hmm. diabetologists will go crazy when you tell them this because the last thing you want to do is disable the activity of insulin in a person. What, what does that actually do in terms of how cells work if you disable insulin? Well, it or is it insulin receptors? It, well, it, it's the activity of insulin. So you disable, partially disable the receptor, and the whole uh, biochemical cascade that insulin causes is blunted. That turns out when you do that, though, it enhances a bunch of defense mechanisms. So mm. we think that what that's done is we've fooled them. They're now hallucinating that they're, they're in a dietary restricted environment, huh. and they've upregulated all of these um, defense mechanisms. Huh, fascinating.